We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts. I hope you're having a good week so far, and I hope you've enjoyed the holidays. And we'll be looking at Acts chapter 26 tonight. So if you want to be joining me in the Word of God, I'd appreciate it. That'd be good if we could be together on a page in the Bible. So Acts 26 is where we'll be in just a few minutes. If you can be here this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11 for worship, be sure to sign up online. You can do that tonight through the Sign Up Genius account. And I hope that all of you can also be present for the Bible class at 10 o'clock. I think we're continuing to look at the exploits of King David. Just a quick note for those who are members of the Four Lakes congregation, we have a brand new sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the entryway for cleaning the building as well as snow removal and lawn mowing. And your help is needed, even if you think you might not be able to do snow removal. Maybe lawn mowing is your thing, and that would be a good thing to do. Sign up right now for June. You are not able to sign up for lawn mowing in January or snow removal in August. That's not how that works. Uh, some have tried in the past, but I think you'll see what I mean when you look at the sign-up sheet. But uh, anyway, if you're at, at all capable of cleaning a church building, it is not difficult work, but it is something that happens on a regular basis, and we certainly appreciate it, especially in the pandemic that we're in, to come together and to have a clean building. Uh, it's a very important thing that needs to be done. And again, not uh, not laborious, physically demanding, but uh, taking about uh, 10, 20, 30 minutes or so every week. Uh, feel free to come early on a Sunday morning, stay late on a Sunday, or come on a Monday at 3 in the morning or Friday night or whenever you can do that. Sign up with another uh, person or another family, another couple, and uh, we would really appreciate that. But we do enjoy having a, a physical building to meet in. And many of you who were here uh, 20 years ago or so remember uh, the challenge of meeting in the elementary school. We only had that facility for three hours every week, and it did the job. We were able to get together for worship. Somebody else did the cleaning, but once we got a building of our own, we took on some additional responsibility. So with blessing comes responsibility, and if you're able to help with that, let me know or just go ahead and sign up. There's a checklist for cleaning right inside the closet at the top of the back stairs, uh, the shovels are, are upstairs outside. We've got salt and everything. So if I can help in some way, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Uh, but there is a good need for that. Uh, tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. And so this is the, the book of Acts, the book of gospel action. Some of the acts of some of the apostles, as, some of, as we've discussed it through the last few months together. It's written by Luke. Luke is described in the book of Colossians chapter 4. He's described by Paul as being the beloved physician. So he's a medical doctor. So he has a unique perspective on the life of Jesus and of the history of the early church. And Luke would be volume 1, the life of Christ. Acts would be volume 2, the history of the church. And he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, just giving him a history of the uh, Christian faith and the early church. By way of just very brief review, we just run through these every week for those who may be joining us for the first time. And just to bring us up to speed, we're using the ABCs of Acts as something of a memory tool. So there's a letter of the alphabet assigned to each chapter. And up to this point, we've looked at the ascension, the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons, always with a question mark since they aren't... Uh, uh, labeled as deacons, they seem to do the work that deacons would do in that chapter. Then great hero, which was Stephen. How can I? I am Jesus. Journey to Joppa. Kingdom includes Gentiles. Liberated again. Missionary sent out. Not gods, but men. The old law is not binding. Philippian jailer converted. Questions answered in Athens. Reasoning with a preacher. Saving our religious friends. Troas on the Lord's day. Uproar in Jerusalem. Valuable citizenship. Waiting to kill Paul, the excuses of Felix. Last week we found that Paul was yet untried by Caesar. And tonight we look at the fact that Paul was zealous toward God. So tonight, zealous toward God. That's what we're looking at in Acts chapter 26. Again, also by way of very brief review, when he returns from his third missionary journey, Paul is nearly killed by the mob in the temple. In the courtyard, he's rescued by the Roman soldiers. He's transferred up to Caesarea to keep him safe. And in Caesarea, Paul appears before Governor Felix, who leaves him confined for two years before Felix is replaced by Governor Festus. When Festus takes over, Paul makes his defense. And instead of being sent back to Jerusalem to face an unfair trial, Paul appeals to Caesar. That was something a Roman citizen was able to do. And Paul definitely was a Roman citizen. 
Well, the new governor Festus, though, he's not sure what charges to send with Paul to Caesar, and so he consults with King Agrippa, who just happens to be visiting. There's this huge feast going on, a lot of pomp and, and so on, and something maybe similar to a state dinner at the White House today. So all of the important government officials are there, all the big uh, leaders, and Paul is invited to make his defense before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. So they're in the royal residence in Caesarea, and we have the remains of that palace or that government facility. It's in the picture on your screen if you're able to see that tonight. Uh, this is almost certainly the place where Paul is making his defense yet again in the passage that we will be looking at tonight. So this brings us to Acts chapter 26. So we pick up tonight with Acts 26, and let's start with the first three verses. Acts 26, verses 1 through 3. Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Well, up in verse 1, King Agrippa takes charge of this meeting, which is kind of interesting. As I understand it, King Agrippa is the son of the King Agrippa who killed the Apostle James uh, earlier in this book. Uh, it's the same guy who accepted praise as if he were a god and he was eaten by worms and died. So that's this guy's son. So this King Agrippa here in Acts 26 is the son of that King Agrippa from Acts chapter 12. So just to kind of uh, bring us up to speed. I think he took office uh, when he was about 17 years old, when his dad was eaten by worms and died. So he's been in office for a number of years ago. Well, in this passage, obviously the king outranks the governor, and so they've come together to figure out what charge to uh, charge Paul with before sending him to the emperor. Agrippa then invites Paul to speak in the middle of verse 1. Paul stretches out his hand. He seems to do this quite often. This is the way he speaks. He gestures. We know that he's chained at this point. So I can imagine hearing uh, the rattling of uh, chains as he gestures. So it's kind of an interesting thing for me at least to think about there. But he jumps right into it. With reference to the accusations made by the Jews, Paul starts with something of a compliment. He doesn't go overboard like the Jewish uh, lawyer Tertullus did in the previous chapter. But he's very respectful. He recognizes in verse 3 that King Agrippa is something of an expert in the customs and the questions among the Jews. Obviously, as a ruler of that area, the king knows things. He's heard cases before. He's dealt with these people over a number of years. He's heard cases here and there. This man would be something of an expert just being in that position. So he knows the ins and the outs of their laws and their customs and the things that they are accustomed to doing. At the end of verse 3, Paul, his only request of the king is that he listen patiently. As I understand it, the word Paul uses here for patiently, it's a word that refers to waiting a long time before getting mad. And I find that kind of fascinating. So please hear me out and don't get too mad before I'm done speaking. So just give me a chance and listen carefully without getting upset at me. So uh, listen carefully to what I'm saying. That, that's what, uh, what's, uh, what I'm requesting here. So it seems like a fair request, and it's something certainly we would expect of any government leader. We would hope that they would at least listen to the case. Of course, that's not always the case, but it, at least that's what Paul is hoping for. So let's pick up then tonight with the next paragraph, Acts 26, verses 4 through 8. Acts 26, 4 through 8. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day, and for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? Well, starting up in verse 4, Paul is laying the foundation. He is introducing himself to King Agrippa. He does this in a way that includes his accuser. So everybody, including these men here in this room, they all know who I am. And they all know that I have a reputation for being faithful. So here he, he emphasizes that he is a Pharisee. Pharisees, that was the strictest sect of Judaism. They were known for 
uh, being sticklers about the law. So he's not some fringe weirdo out there teaching some strange, new, bizarre thing, but, but he's been known all of his life for strictly adhering to the law of Moses and for teaching others to do the same. So Paul is uh, reminding them of his reputation here at the beginning. You know who I am. I am one of you. Then, starting in verse 7, he transitions to the resurrection. And he doesn't use the word resurrection right away, but he heads in that direction. He eases into it, we might say. And he does this in a way where most people in the room could probably see it coming. And so he explains he's on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. So again, this isn't some far-out, bizarre teaching nobody could ever have anticipated. Uh, but this is really what the Jewish faith is all about. It goes all the way back to Abraham. It goes back to the promise that all nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed. It's the promise that all of us living today still hope to attain. And so he's addressing the people in the room in this very respectful way here at the beginning. So this is the reason why we serve God. And this is the promise uh, the reason why Paul is on trial, it all goes back to the resurrection. And since he's on trial for the resurrection, he makes it personal with a challenge. A question in verse 8, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So it's amazing. It's a wonderful, amazing thing to consider, but it is not impossible. In other words, if you believe the prophets like Elijah and Elisha, then you know that coming back from the dead is within the realm of possibility. They both raise people from the dead. Otherwise, you don't really believe in the prophets. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in the word of God because we have a record of several resurrections in the Old Testament. So Paul then is establishing that he's on trial for the resurrection of the dead. And the most people in the room already believe in the resurrection. So let's move forward then and pick up tonight with Acts 26 verses 9 through 11. Acts 26, 9 through 11, as Paul continues his defense. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Notice, starting in verse 9, Paul now tells his story. So, he starts with what they have in common. I'm a Pharisee. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in the prophets just like you do. Now, he shifts to how he is different. So, this is what's happened to him over the past several years. And uh, this news about Jesus, it, it started to spread, it, it started to take root, and when it did, Paul came down on the side of opposing Jesus, didn't he? And I, I find it interesting here that Paul admits this. It's almost as if he's saying, I've been where many of you are right now. I missed it. I misinterpreted the resurrection. I, I misinterpreted Jesus just as you did. So I, I made the same mistake. We were in the same spot. And because of this, Paul's mission was at one point to crush the Christian faith. His mission was to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And he's, he, he's admitting this. He's not proud of it, but he's sharing his story. And he was quite successful at it, as we know. Paul was a leader of the Jewish resistance to Jesus. Many people were locked up. Uh, he chased them down from city to city. He put them in prisons. And not only that, but once he brought them back to Jerusalem, Paul cast his vote against them. Uh, some have taken this to suggest that Paul was perhaps a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. They would vote on these things. And so if that's the case, if Paul is saying, I cast my vote against them in that way, then we may be able to assume uh, that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. So, in other words, all in favor of killing this Christian, raise your hand or, or say I or put your stone in a certain bowl or bucket or, or something like that, as we might explain it today. Well, if Paul truly was a member of the Sanhedrin, then we could also conclude that he was married and had children. Those were qualifications for serving on the Sanhedrin. Uh, later, Paul describes himself as being single 
which means that he was either widowed or divorced, or maybe that his wife had abandoned him because he obeyed the gospel and she did not. This is all speculation, but it is speculation with some basis in a possible fact that would apply to this scenario. And uh, we get this uh, from this brief reference to Paul casting his vote against them. So that's the idea. If he cast his vote against them, that was a common thing they did on the Sanhedrin. If, therefore, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, if that's what he's saying here, then Paul must have been married at some point. But again, uh, we're just basing that on this one passing reference here. Um, so that's possible that he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, but it's not demanded by this passage. So we have options here. Uh, he might be using this something uh, in something of a generic sense, the idea that he was in favor of killing the Christians. So not that he cast his vote in some official capacity, but that he gave them his approval. So yes, go ahead, do what you're planning on doing. I, I am voting with the council, even though I'm not a member of it. Uh, ultimately, we don't know whether Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin or not, but we do know that he was in favor of persecuting the church and actually led the movement against Christianity at the beginning. In fact, in verse 11, Paul explains how he punished them often, tried to force them to blaspheme. He was furiously enraged at them and kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And I find this interesting. Paul seems almost exasperated here. Like, I tried to get them to blaspheme. That's just an interesting way of wording that. He doesn't say that he did get them to blaspheme, but he tried. And I think we can learn from this that he most likely failed at that. And that is why he was... Uh, furiously enraged. He, he could not get them to turn on each other, and he could not get them to turn against the Lord. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here. And uh, we do know about the example from Damascus. Uh, Damascus, though, was apparently one of many cities that Paul visited with the goal of tracking down Christians and dragging them back to Jerusalem. And I think this is where we get the idea in this chapter that Paul was zealous toward God. He's reminding his audience here that he was once very zealous for the Jewish faith in persecuting the Christian faith. Uh, he explains this, by the way, over in another passage, somewhat parallel to this one, in Galatians 1, verses 13 and 14, when he says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And this zeal is certainly reflected here in Paul's defense before King Agrippa. So Paul was zealous toward God. And I would point out he's still zealous toward God, isn't he? Uh, but his mission has shifted, of course, from Judaism to uh, the Christian faith. So let's pick up with Acts 26, verses 12 through 18. The next paragraph here is Paul continues his defense before the king. Acts 26, 12 through 18. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. In the first part of this paragraph, we have Paul's description of what happens on the road to Damascus. So he's on his way to terrorize Christians with the permission of the chief priests, some of whom are probably now standing there accusing him before King Agrippa. That would not surprise me one bit. And I'm not surprised that that's probably why Paul included this in here. In other words, saying, remember, you gave me letters and now here you are uh, kind of turned against me. But he sees this bright light, brighter than the sun. This is a supernatural thing. It's not that the clouds just passed and, oh, the sun kind of blinded me. Not, not that at all. It's brighter than the sun. He falls to the ground. He hears the voice asking in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I think we cover this uh, previously in this book a time or two. The first time it happens, and then as he retells it later, now again, he's retelling it again. 
Uh, as to the church, we are the Lord's body. And I think we just, just need to note again that to persecute the church is to persecute the Lord. So we are his body. He is the head of the body. If somebody persecutes us, if we persecute the church ourselves, we are persecuting the Lord. So if somebody terrorizes the church, they're terrorizing the Lord Jesus himself. And we have something new here. I don't think we had earlier. As Paul refers to Jesus saying, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. I don't think we found that in Acts 22 or Acts 9, the earlier accounts of this. But it's basically a reference, as I understand it, to a cattle prod. Uh, today, these might be electric, right? The batteries, something you'd find at Farm and Fleet or whatever. Uh, back then, of course, it was common and still is quite common today for people to drive cattle by poking them with a sharp stick of some kind. And you can get sharp sticks at, uh, you know, Farm and Fleet or uh, Tractor Supply or whatever back there with the shepherd staffs and all that kind of thing. So uh, they would just poke the cows, poke the cattle, move them along, that kind of thing. And ultimately, the rancher or whoever it is will win. The cattle will not win this fight, will they? I mean, ultimately, the cattle will submit. The, the farmer's going to catch them. And, and uh, I think the cowboy's going to outlast the, the cattle. That's uh, the way it usually goes. And I think the Lord is saying to Paul then, in the same way, you won't win this fight. Uh, you're kicking against the goats. Just go ahead, give in, and uh, admit that you're wrong and, and switch sides here. I, maybe that's just my kind of weak way of paraphrasing this. may not be totally accurate, but I think that's what the Lord is communicating here. And at this point, Paul says, well, well, who are you, Lord? And the Lord obviously has Paul's attention. This is amazing. I'm, I can't see. Here's the Lord standing in front of me in this vision. And, and Paul uh, absolutely wants to know who this is. Well, the Lord identifies himself as Jesus whom you are persecuting. And he goes on to explain Paul's mission in life, to be a witness to the Gentiles turning them from the darkness to light, to free them from the rule of Satan, to direct them to God so they can be forgiven, so they can receive an inheritance. As I was just reading this again, I was uh, thinking that sounds an awful lot like the opening chapter in Colossians, about halfway through Colossians. A lot of the wording from this passage is found uh, later in Colossians. But this always amazes me, that God would take a leading Jewish scholar and he would use this man to reach out to the Gentiles. I know, I'm thinking, if I were doing this, I think I would take Paul and use him to reach out to the Jews, to reach out to one of his own people with similar education, background, and income, and that kind of thing as a leading Jew himself. But that's not what the Lord does. God plans on using Paul's knowledge of the law to basically bring the Gentiles up to speed. And I hope that makes sense. And I, I think they did need an expert and they needed somebody with the heart of a teacher. And Paul was a teacher himself. And that is absolutely what Paul does for the rest of his life. But the point here for us is, as Paul makes his defense to King Agrippa, he's just explaining this vision. So he's retelling the story of how he ended up switching sides here. So this is the truth. This is what I actually saw with my own eyes. So let's continue then with what Paul says next. This is Acts 26, verses 19 through 23. Acts 26, 19 through 23. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And so, we come then to this passage here, and after explaining how he sees Jesus on the road to Damascus and how he, uh, the Lord sent him to the Gentiles, he explains to King Agrippa that he decides not to disobey that heavenly vision. And I love how he puts that. Um, as I see it, he's inviting King Agrippa into the story. If you had seen what I saw on the road, what would you have done? And I think that's kind of the question that he's implying here. Obviously, when the Lord speaks to you directly, it is better to obey than to disobey. And so Paul then, he obeys. And that's what he's saying. What choice did I have? I mean, obviously I did have a choice, but really what choice did I have? The Lord God appeared to me personally 
and told me these things. So what would you do, King Agrippa? This is what I did. And so Paul obeys and he starts preaching repentance starting immediately right there in Damascus. And we remember that back in Acts chapter 9. That's what he did. And then he moved back down to Jerusalem. We studied that. We studied the trouble that he had there. And then he moved throughout the whole area, even preaching to the Gentiles. And again, the message is repentance. That is the message of the gospel. So there is a, a mental decision. I would point that out here. But then there also has to be that action that is based on that decision. Uh, very similar to the preaching of John the Immerser. He was very specific in his preaching, wasn't he? He didn't just say, well, try to do better, everybody, but he was very specific. And people asked him questions. He gave concrete answers. This is what you actually need to do. This is not theoretical. This is very practical. And I believe Paul is the same way. So turn to God and then do stuff. That's my simple explanation. Turn to God and do stuff. So have a change of mind and then allow that change of mind to actually continue with a change of action. That's what Paul is talking about here. In verse 21, Paul explains that this preaching of repentance to the Gentiles, this is the real reason why the Jews are trying to kill him. It's not that Paul brought Gentiles into the temple like they accused him of doing. There's no evidence of that at all. There's nothing Paul has done to actually break the Jewish law. Nothing like that. He's not inciting riots. Nothing like that either. But these people are mad that Paul has been preaching repentance to the Gentiles. That's what this all is all about. Um, they absolutely hate the Gentiles, and it just burns them up to think that God might accept the Gentiles into his heavenly kingdom. And that's why they tried to put Paul to death. And this, by the way, is the real crime here, isn't it? The only crime referenced in this passage is these men trying to murder Paul for no good reason. And I think that's why Paul kind of threw that in here. It's not by accident. But he's saying, these men tried to murder me. And uh, if anybody's guilty standing in this room, it's them for trying to kill me for no good reason. Starting in verse 22, Paul summarizes what he's been doing with God's help. I've been speaking to anybody who will listen, the small and the great. And we have examples of this in the book of Acts already, don't we? Uh, when I think of the small, you know, everyday hardworking people, there, there are those in Acts like Lydia, a, a businesswoman. There's a, the Philippian jailer, kind of blue collar, getting it done kind of guy. But, but we also think of the great in the book of Acts, don't we? The philosophers. The highly educated men on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece, as well as uh, kings and governors like Agrippa and Felix and Festus. And whenever Paul had opportunities like this, he simply repeated exactly what Moses and the prophets had predicted from ancient times. That the Christ would suffer and would come back from the dead. That's a message that Paul would preach to the Jews and to the Gentiles alike. And this is why Paul was in trouble with the Jews. His message wasn't new and rev revolutionary, but his message was very, very, very old. It was the old, old story, as we might say. I remember a preaching class many years ago from Fried Hardeman University, and one of the older preachers in that class made the point that as gospel preachers, our goal is not to preach something new. Our goal is to preach something very, very old. And at first I thought, you know, as a 19-year-old preaching student, no, I want to preach, you know, new stuff that, you know, be interesting in that, in that way. And I think I understand what I was thinking at that point in my life, but I also look back at what that man was saying and, and I see the wisdom in that. Our goal is not to preach something new. Our goal is to preach something very, very old. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's just preaching Moses and the prophets and, and bringing that into his modern time. So let's pick up tonight then with Acts 26, 24 through 29. Acts 26, 24 through 29. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a, quarter, a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am 
except for these chains. To me, it almost seems as if Festus interrupts at this point, doesn't it? It's almost like the men interrupting Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, but uh, there is no as we stand and sing kind of moment, but uh, Festus interrupts Paul's speaking here, and as he hears what Paul is saying, it, it seems to him as if Paul has completely lost his mind. And to me, it's almost, it's, it's over my head. Uh, you know, Paul, you're nuts. You, you've completely lost it here. And Paul responds, though, not with an insult. He doesn't res respond with an insult for an insult, but he responds with a reminder. I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. I utter words of sober truth, words of truth and reason. Um, Brett Rutherford and I, when he was in Madison, I was down in Janesville. We had a little paper we mailed out to all the churches in Wisconsin, and I think we called it Words of Truth and Reason. And it goes back to a translation of this passage. So I utter words of sober truth, just as we try to speak today. Uh, just a note here again that Paul describes Festus as most excellent, a term that Luke also uses to refer to Theophilus, the first recipient of Luke and Acts. And this is why we think Theophilus might have been a government official of some kind. So Luke is writing to put his mind at ease, giving examples of how the apostles interacted with government. We're not out to overthrow earthly governments. We are not against, we are not anti-government. And so I'm just saying most excellent is a term that has been seen earlier with reference to the recipient of this book. Uh, with this, Paul seems to pretty much give up on Festus. Like, <laughs> he doesn't say it, but okay, you know, I'm not the one who, who's nuts here. And so he kind of, I can't spend any more time with him. Je Jesus warned about casting your pearls before swine. So I think he kind of falls in the swine category here. And so here he now, Paul does, turns his attention to King Agrippa, doesn't he? So there's somebody else that I'm aiming at with this lesson. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And that's very interesting. Jesus often taught by asking thoughtful questions and what an amazing question this is. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And so he's assuming the best of his audience. He's assuming the best of King Agrippa, even though he's probably a very evil man. But Paul does hold out some hope for this man. And Agrippa's response, I think, indicates this as well. In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Uh, this, by the way, is the, uh, I think, only the, the second of three times the word Christian is found in the Bible. A lot of people may think it's found more than that. It's not. It's only three times. Uh, the first is in Acts 11.26 with reference to the disciples in Antioch who were first called Christians. We have this passage, which is the second one. And then we also have number three is a reference in 1 Peter 4.16, where Peter says that if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but is to glorify God in this name. So only three references to Christian. This is the second of those three. Uh, besides this, it seems that Agrippa is maybe close to obeying the gospel. That may be one way of taking this. And we certainly do have a song based on this passage, don't we? Uh, almost persuaded, now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, go, spirit, go thy way, some more convenient day on thee I'll call. That almost seems like from the previous chapter, mixing that in, uh, mixing our pictures here. Almost persuaded, come, come today, almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here, angels are lingering near, prayers rise from hearts so dear, O oh, wanderer, come. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail, almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail, almost but lost. Does that sound familiar to us? Almost persuaded, that song seems to be based on this passage. And the point of that song is, almost is not quite good enough, is it? And the lesson for us is, let's make sure we don't miss heaven by just a little bit. And uh, Agrippa was just at a, an absolutely critical point in his life. The translations, I would point out, do vary just a little bit on this. Some see Agrippa's words here as an insult. The NIV, for example, has Agrippa saying, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And that's kind of condescending, isn't it? Um, do you think in just a few minutes you can talk me into your scheme, you know, so maybe that's what Paul was saying here, maybe not. Um, but either way, Agrippa was face to face with one of the greatest gospel preachers to ever walk the face of this earth, but we have no record 
of him ever obeying the gospel. That this is where, this is the last reference. By the way, this I believe is also the last record of Paul's uh, sermon. Uh, any sermon that Paul actually preached. This is the last record, if I remember correctly, in one of the commentaries I was reading the other day. Um, we do learn something from Paul's response to Agrippa's response. He doesn't beg, does he? He doesn't harass. He doesn't get discouraged personally. But he makes it clear his wish is that Agrippa would someday respond to Paul's message. In other words, the, the ball's in his court. It, it's up to him to decide this now. There's nothing else that Paul can do to convince this man. It's almost like the rich young ruler. When he walked away sad, Jesus didn't chase him down, but he's presented the truth to him. This is what needs to be done. Now it, it's up to the man. Well, let's conclude tonight by looking at Acts 26 verses 30 through 32. Acts 26, 30 through 32. The king stood up, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them, and when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Here at the end, everybody gets up, so things over. Um, the leading characters have this conversation over to the side, and their conclusion is Paul has done nothing worthy of death. And remember, that the point of this meeting was to come up with charges before sending Paul to Caesar. They still don't have any charges. Uh, but since Paul has appealed to Caesar, they don't really have a choice in this matter, so they're kind of have to send him without formal charges, or at least anything accurate. Uh, and so Paul now is heading to Rome. And this is where we hope to pick up next week. Tonight, though, we have the reminder that Paul is zealous toward God. He explains his zeal for the Christian faith to King Agrippa. And this zeal almost convinces King Agrippa to obey the gospel, although he doesn't quite get to that point yet. As we think back over what happens in this chapter, one thing I think we notice is that it really seems that Agrippa and Festus are the men on trial here, doesn't it? Paul is the one in chains, isn't he? But Festus and Agrippa are the ones who are truly facing God's judgment. And that's where this applies to us. We now have Paul's words, and now that really puts us on trial here. What will we do with Paul's message? Will we obey it? Will we dedicate our lives to it? Will we have the zeal that he did? Or will we put it off like King Agrippa did? Thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. Again, I hope to see you this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11, and for the Bible class at 10. Uh, sign up on Sign Up Genius now if you can. We appreciate that. And uh, let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. I hope to work on the bulletin on Saturday, uh, midday to mid-afternoon. So if you have any changes, anything that needs to be updated, especially since I was out of town this week and wasn't there with you in person, uh, give me a call or send a text or uh, email. Let me know what, what needs to be included in the bulletin. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his resurrection from the dead. And thank you for saving us from our sins. We recognize tonight that you are the judge of all the earth. And we realize that there is a time coming when all people who have ever lived will stand before you in judgment. We pray that you will be with us as we prepare for that day to come. In Jesus we pray. Amen.